I there is a story that uh, according to which uh, you played Eric Dolphy Memorial Barbecue pa- yes. with CS80 I know as a string quartet. Oh, that's the only time, the first and I think the only time I ever saw Frank's eyes get wet for music. Uh, we were in England at the Hammersmith Odeon and it was a sound check and it was one of those sound checks that nothing was going on you could just blow if you wanted to I didn't even know Frank was there and we started playing Eric Dolphy and, and I had the most beautiful string quartet sound on the CS80 the, that instrument was very cool but it wasn't their normal string sound you didn't put the chorus on you just turned the button for chorus but you actually didn't turn the chorus on so it didn't have that chorusy sound it had like a rosined bow sound that with the um, uh, inaccuracy, if you will, of the portamento. You didn't know how much portamento the cello would go Voo, down to the note. Yeah. And the beauty of the CS80 was the polyphonic aftertouch. Each note, when you push in, would have a different setting of vibrato, a different degree of vibrato. And I played that, man, and and I, I was reharmonizing it, too. And all of a sudden, I realized Frank was standing in back of me, right, right on the side of me. I looked up, and I, he just said, Tommy, that's like the most beautiful thing you've ever played. That is unbelievably beautiful. And I could see that his eyes were wet, you know what I mean? He, it, it moved him. And it scared me, because Frank was not like that. He yeah. never was like that. And I caught one little glimpse, and that's the only time I ever saw him. But it, it moved me heavily to see that what I had done. See, when we played Eric Dolphy, it was straight ahead jazz. It wasn't sweet. It wasn't pretty. And I, I was really playing it very romantically sounding with a string quartet. Yeah. Tell, tell me the story. Thank you for remembering about that. That's, <laughs> I didn't know you knew yeah, that. Yeah. Tell me about the story of you presenting your gear um, to Pierre Boulet in France. Oh, boy. Whew. Frank was very sick that night. Yeah incredibly sick and I don't know what he had man but he was doubled over and here's Pierre like all hot to trot Mr. Bon Vivant yeah. and Frank is like dying and he says Tommy go out and show him your gear I said Frank this is Pierre Boulez man you gotta be shitting me I've never <laughs> I've never met he says J- just he's just a regular dude just go out there and show him but just show him what the little poly box is show him the vocoder and I, I said, okay. So I walk him out, and there's there's like freaking people in the audience, and they're screaming my name, and here's Pierre Boulez in front of a rock audience, man. You know, like a hearty high-ho silver. So I go up to my setup, and I said, well, this is called a poly box. This is uh, an interface of the, elect- the three electrocomp instruments that I'm using. And I have my instrument playing the melody note on top. This French horn sound, and I illustrated, there's the French horn. Now, when I pull this uh, uh, fader up, this poly box comes in, and it has a memory to it that will remember the chord until I change the chord. It was an actual keyboard. So it's like a polyphonic choir of a sound, and and it's a pitch matcher that it will follow the pitch of the master instrument. It's acting as a slave. So he said, you mean you can just hold on as many notes of this chord as you want? I said, yeah. And he and I had a very hip chord, like a root, minor second, fourth, fifth, and a major seven, say, with it. And and it was really like like shearing meets uh, fucking, you know, Ives sounding. <laughs> and and it like black, yeah. pointillistic yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. And, and then on the top, to add the icing to the cake, the little sinky, I had a piccolo sound. So it's like a classic orchestration sound of a high piccolo playing the melody note three octaves above the yeah, French horn yeah, sound. Yeah. And then sandwiched in the middle is this chord that is like parallel. And yet when I did a sports sound, I was saying, Bum! you know what I mean? Yeah. And he was bold a fucking way. And with, with even the brass sound, then I'd make the sustain of the note longer and put a different type of vibrato and it would turn into a stringish kind of sound. He loved that because he said, you know what, I'm writing chords right now just like this, parallel like this, yeah. superimposed with other chords, yeah. other like choirs of instruments that have blocks of chords just like this chord. So I felt very cool that I, I'm, see, I'm actually playing 
chords that Pierre Boulez is grooving with parallel. I, it made me feel like, wow, I'm part of the team, baby. So anyway, uh, he says, what's this? And I paid him the vocoder. And I, I started playing my bass pedals to give it some bottom with it, and then blast a couple of chords with the CS80 and, and play the vocoder. He was, he was wild with, with excitement with it. And uh, then I think I played him some tremolo stuff that I had on the, the electro comp. But he liked it a lot. And then I, I think during the show, Frank had to sort of go down the shopping list with him, too. Yeah. But, you know, that was kind of embarrassing for me, actually, that particular yeah. show. I, I didn't want to do that. You know, I, I yeah. felt cheap doing that. But I did what Frank wanted me to do. Yeah. You know? How do you see those instruments today? I see them Are still as pinnacle instruments. Believe yeah. me, I use a lot of technology of today. And say, for instance, those parallel chords. Well, okay. You know what? It took three instruments to do what one instrument can do today with that kind of stuff. But the sound is not the same. Yeah. Sure, I don't have to tune those instruments. Yeah. Sure, I can pick, um, you know, they have 200 instruments in a box today. Yeah. But maybe I can use two of those sounds. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I much prefer having a dedicated setup. Do you know what I mean? One yeah. instrument is dedicated to this. It, it, it leaves it so open. You know, there's so much pressure on keyboard players to find the, the little buttons to push, and you, you can't, like, change things immediately. It's very, very frustrating, let alone the polyphonic aftertouch thing. They've sacrificed that, so it's just channel aftertouch, a lot of companies. And, like, I've tried to have companies make me stuff, and they just say it's not cost-effective to do this. You know, it's, it's, it's rough out there. Sometimes it makes me just want to go back to B3 and piano sometimes, you know? Uh, do you remember singing envelopes uh, like this? I'm screwing you, I'm screwing yeah, you. Right. Yeah, right. Well, that That's started off thing. on the plane. Frank had envelopes written. He was writing it. And I think he was writing the second piano part to it. And I'm looking over his shoulder, and I'm really grooving it. And he says, you like this? I said, yeah, this is happening. I started, I started like, singing it. And, and sure enough, that night I get to the gig... And we haven't even started rehearsing envelopes, and he's got lyrics for me to sing, you know, already. Yeah. He would do that constantly with me. Uh, very obscene lyrics. Very <laughs> obscene, isn't it? In and out. In. Yeah. <laughs> so Squat what? on my blaster! <laughs> Make it go faster! <laughs> yeah. Squat on my blaster. Can you imagine doing that every night, man? <laughs> oh, it was great. Or fuck me, you ugly son of a bitch. Or you're an asshole. You're an asshole, too. You know what I mean? That was therapy. That was catharsis. Yeah. Did you like doing uh, envelopes? I loved doing yeah. envelopes. Yeah. I loved that song. I think it's a difficult piece. Yes. It yeah. was a very difficult piece. But we, we pulled it off, generally speaking, every night. Yeah. So I had to do Peter's part when we recorded it over. I had to actually redo Peter Wolf's part yeah. of that, yeah. yeah. Could you tell me something about your solo work today, about your uh, recording that is forthcoming, I think? Well, what would you like to know about it? Uh, what kind of music and... Well, it's got a, a jazz sensibility to it, but within that jazz realm, there's a kind of a gothic classical flair to it. That's that's. Uh, it's like... It's sort of neo Zappa, you might say. You know what I mean? It, it has a, a bite of Frank in it because because I I was very much in tune with who Frank was before I got to Frank, and then when I worked for him for all those years, it it impressed that style upon me more. That that you know it, it developed that part of me. So I'm still doing sort of the same things that that I did with Frank, and I have a kind of pop sensibility too within that. I I have songs that have lyrics as well. But it's it's typical Mars, you know, and it's uh, it's not completed yet. I keep chiseling away at it, and I'm not obsessed by it. Yeah. Do you have a band of your own? Not uh, that is like my own band yeah. at the moment. I had a unit that we were we all brought a couple of tunes to the table about two years ago. It was called um, um, what do we call it? Epicenter, because we did it right after the big earthquake out here, yeah. and we played a few gigs around. And that's sort of disbanded. But I probably will have a band soon. Yeah. I'm working with a very fine singer right now, uh, a woman. Her name's Laura Easy. And she's singing some of those incredibly high things for me. Uh, so that's uh, what you are doing for a living now? 
Well, yeah. As I say, I'm a hired gun. I yeah, do a lot. Yeah. Like I did a comedy show, Family Matters, a little while yeah. ago. Uh, I do, I do a fair amount of commercial work. Yeah. Um, I teach a lot. Where? Band, band from Utopia is yeah. going to go out yeah. again yeah. in uh, September, I believe. I think I have. To, I'm going out with a guy, Fred Ralston, a percussionist, June first. I think I'll be out for three weeks or so. I did his record in November. So he's going out for like three weeks. Basically, you know, hired gun work. 